rise. Um, Mr. Wynn, I noticed your client's not in court. Oh, he's just coming in. You had trouble getting in the... Uh, That's my understanding. The trouble, it, it is difficult getting in on a busy Wednesday. Here he is. Well, no. I do apologize. No, no, it's all right. We, I know how difficult it is to get into the building sometimes um, after lunch. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Yes. Um, are you content for me to proceed? Of course. Um, we were on the point of construction. Of yes, Section you started 14. with your hierarchy point. We did, and um, that brings me on to my next point, yep. um, which is um, Section 42.1a a, um, under the definition of civil proceedings order. So we're on page 10 of the authorities bundle. Uh, and uh, the definition of civil uh, a civil civil proceedings order there is clear. No civil proceeding shall without the leave of the High Court be instituted. That is emphatic and clear that permission of the High Court is intended to be mandatory. Um, and it's the institution of proceedings without permission that's prohibited. Well, but that doesn't tell us anything about the consequences if you breach that mandatory requirement. It's not enough in and of itself to um, have the effect that we contend for. So much is clear from... Um, Paragraph seven of Law Lord Bingham, Bingham yes. Yeah. But it, it forms part of the picture. Yeah. It doesn't get us all the way there because we also have to persuade you as to the purpose behind the provision to get all the way there. I'm going to come on to that in the next section of my submissions. But it is right to observe that that language has been used by Parliament. Um, section 1A, subsection B, um, as my lady um, has already observed, um, permission can only be granted to continue proceedings where the civil proceedings were instituted before the making of the uh, CPO. Um, there's pausing there, there's nothing in section 42 which provides for any power to stay or continue proceedings otherwise than as provided by section 42.1a b. And um, just before we get on to uh, the requirement for leave, in subsection three, a point that arose this morning about um, 1AC, no application. Um, our, our position on that would be that any person is capable of including uh, the person against whom the order is made, but we take, I think it's- um, Lord Justice Walker's point, wasn't it? In the, um, wasn't he, was, someone says it would be absurd if it meant that every application. Yes, but the way around that um, would be um, the pragmatic point that leave can be granted to make application. The point I was making. Uh, uh, when you're granted permission. You should ask for, ask for cover for all ancillary applications. Indeed. Okay. Um, well, that's, um, I don't think that's common practice. And it's not what one would immediately take from the section, which identifies what, the, what a civil proceeding order is going to say. Well... There it is. Our position is any person is broad enough to, on its face, to um, include the person against whom the order is made. It certainly doesn't... So if it, no particular order is made in relation to applications, are you saying that if a person, having got leave to institute the proceedings, wishes then to amend them, they have to get leave? On the face of it, yes. We, yes. we, we say that that is the ordinary meaning of that. And all extensions of right, time, all, all interlocutory... Orders. Yes, we would you say... You have to apply every time to the High Court. On the face of um, the provision as drafted, it's that draconian. Well, what do you... What, 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 it, so, there was a... It was, it was Lord Justice... Yes, it was Lord Justice Ronald Walker. Ronald yeah. Walker, who said, it can't mean that. The line must be drawn somewhere. But wherever the law, li line is drawn, the uh, application of provision to appeal must be well over the wrong side of it, or whatever his words to that effect. So... Um, you, you, we... we that was an observation made. Okay. Um, I think it was identified as an argument rather than something that was decided. Um, but um, we we appreciate that there that, that um, there are there are practical difficulties that may be created by that interpretation. The way around that 
is for the um, High Court when granting the leave to institute to cover any ancillary um, uh, applications. Um, on um, subsection three, um, leave for the institution or continuance of, um, this is an important point, continuance of we submit is only in the circumstances of section 42.1a.b um, because that is the only provision that provides for circumstances in which um, proceedings can be continued, only in those circumstances where they were instituted before the making of the CPO. Well, institution continuance or making of applications looks to say it's A B C. It's short term for A B C. Isn't it? Correct. Yes. Um, so um, finally, the obvious point to make is there's no warrant in the terms of Section Forty Two for a CPO or indeed an APO. That is an all proceedings order covering both civil proceedings and, and criminal proceedings, um, or indeed a, the other type of CPO, the criminal proceedings order, for them to have any different consequence within the statutory tribunals, the ordinary courts, or indeed the criminal courts. The, the proper interpretation is that the consequence of section 42 is, is to apply, um, the sort of breach of the requirement is to apply in the same way to all courts and tribunals. There's no distinction drawn by Parliament in that respect. And so we submit that permission is a condition precedent and not a condition subsequent of any act specified um, within this set of provisions. Um, the appellant, um, who was the subject of the CPO, instituted civil proceedings without leave of the High Court, and that's precisely what uh, a CPO is intended by Section 42 to prohibit. It doesn't matter in our submission that Section 42 creates a power for the court to impose a CPO. The CPO must be construed consistently with the wording of Section 42 uh, 1A. And this goes to um, one of Mr Wynne's points about uh, alleged distinctions to be drawn between Section 1 through 9 of the Mental Health Act and Section 42 um, of the SCA uh, it, 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 in um, seal. Uh, and if I can just take you to one authority... Um, can to, you just say what your point is? Yes, yeah, so our, our point, um, my lady, is um, it doesn't matter that Section 42 cre creates a power um, under which an order is made. Um, the order has to be construed consistently statutory provisions. So the distinction um, between section 40, an order under section 42 and the position in section 139 is a distinction without any difference at all. And at the, the premise of that um, proposition is found in, a, in one of the many Ewing cases, Henry Garrett and um, Ewing, um, which um, I don't know whether you need to turn. We need to turn to that, but um, it. Where is it? It's at um, uh, two four three um, of the bundle, which is um, tab nineteen, <coughs> and we get that proposition from Lord Donaldson at the bottom of 243, um, 1358, just under H. Um, it must be construed consistently with it. And that follows through into the reasoning in the decision uh, that we get um, 1361 D, to D, E and F, <coughs> where um, the sidebar section uh, where the court held that on a proper construction of section 42 the application for permission to the court of appeal was either the institution, institution of proceedings or the making of an application in civil proceedings so the proposed appeal was barred um, <coughs> so a, a um, and we see that reference there in the middle if on the evidence an order is made it should be in the terms of section 42 1a so a decision reached based on a um, consistent construction between the order and the wording of section 42.1a. Um, and in the instant case, there's no issue that the CPO um, that was imposed on Mr. William, uh, Father, Father Paul Williams was made pursuant to section 42 and follows the language. 
and we say it must be construed consistently with the enabling statutory provisions of section 421A. So there is no... I don't really understand what you mean by, by consistently. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the point that's taken against you is, as I understand it, that what section 42 is providing for, unlike the relevant section of the Mental Health Act, is that an order will be made in these terms. An order may be made in these terms. And that normally when the court makes an order which is in the form of a condition precedent, it does not have the effect of nullifying proceedings if the condition is not met, see, uh, unless orders relief against sanctions. Therefore, it is relevant to draw a distinction between seal, in which here is a statute which imposes a condition precedent, where you've just got to construe the statute, and section 42, where here is a statute which says the court will, in certain circumstances, make this order, and you have to decide what the effect of the order is. Well, well our, our position... So, so where does consistency come into that? Well, well our position is Sorry. that um, Lord, Lord Brown was right to consider that they were analogous because um, section the order, an order made under section 42 um, adopts the uh, prohibition that one sees in the statute and is made under the statute, um, just as we have the prohibition in Section 139 of the Mental Health Act. So we, we, we submit that it's a distinction without any proper difference uh, that, m that Mr Wynne is seeking to draw, that, that um, uh, Lord Brown well had in mind uh, the difference between, uh, we'll have a look at um, passage and seal in a moment, that the regime under Section 42 requires an order to be made because he says those are judged vexatious litigants, so he had that distinction well in mind, but it doesn't matter when it comes to the consequence of breaching the requirements, um, it is our submission. Well, I'm a bit perplexed, it seems rather two-edged uh, to me. If you say uh, it makes no difference whether the court's making an order or the statute's imposing the condition, and if the normal effects of the court imposing an order is that it's not a nullity, because you can get relief from sanctions, if one's looking at things consistently, the consequence ought to be that the statutory interpretation means it's not a nullity. Well, we submit that, se that an order made under Section 42 is an unusual type of order because it repeats and adopts the um, statutory wording of Section 42 that provides that prohibition. Um, and um, we submit that um, it has the same effect as the prohibition in Section 139. Lord Brown was well aware of the the the, um, the the regime under Section Forty Two um, requires an order to be made um, under it, um, but um, he was he was he was right to to consider that it, that it was plainly analogous to Section One Three Nine. But we'll come back to that in a moment when we look at Seal and his reasoning therein. Um, we uh, on the object and purpose. And this is an important part of our, our submissions because it's quite right that the language of the statutory provisions are not enough to get us home. But the purpose, I wish to bring uh, particular attention <coughs> in these oral submissions to Ewing and New, two Court of Appeal level authorities as to the purpose. So Ewing and News International, um, which is at 462 of the appeal bundle. So this is yet another Ewing case that tested the CPO regime and a couple of points to make on 463. Um, but this um, paragraph 3 uh, records the proclivity of Mr Ewing uh, there um, that even after the order had been made, he made at least 19 applications for permission to commence proceedings, most, if not all, of which have been unsuccessful. So one could, um, using the descriptor of very vexatious litigant, place um, the Mr Ewing in that category. Um, but that's important um, uh, because 
uh, in my submission, the proclivity underscores the necessity for the filter of obtaining permission to protect opponents, courts and tribunals from vexatious litigation. We have, um, at paragraph four, uh, Lord Justice Patton uses the word debarred. So he understood um, the debarring effect of the section 42 order. Um, we submit there is no debarring effect if the vexatious litigant is free to institute proceedings first and then seek permission. And we then get the central purpose behind the CPO, which is at paragraph 18 on page 466, the penultimate sentence of that long paragraph. Well, I've not read this paragraph, so can I just run if we just read this paragraph? So um, avoidance of unnecessary use of court time and resources and to protect prospective defendants from the expense which that involves. So um, court of appeal level decision that states that the intention um, behind a CPO is to provide a um, putative defendant um, uh, with protection. Of course, those observations were made in the context of the rest of the paragraph, which is about um, applications for leave, isn't it? Uh, and how they should be dealt with. Yes, um, but that doesn't, in my submission, explain away um, the clear stated purpose of the CPO in that penultimate sentence. Um, it may provide some context in which um, that purpose is given, but we submit that that purpose is self-evident. And a striking feature of the appellant's Skeleton argument. Well, just hold on. The, these are applications before proceedings are instituted. These are not retrospective applications. Indeed, um, my lady, yes. we, we take that, but um, there is some uh, learning to be gained from the statement as to the purpose of a CPO in, in that in that paragraph. Yes, yes. Um, and a striking feature of the appellant's submissions is that um, he, he barely engages with that self-evident object and purpose of the CPO. The purpose just cannot be met if the vexatious litigant is free to institute proceedings, make applications and obtain permission later. In the meantime, all of the uh, prospective respondents, defendants, courts and tribunals will have incurred unnecessary waste of time, expense um, and resources. And that may well include certainly in a case like Ewing, a multiplicity of proceedings, including applications within those proceedings. And this is an important point, um, which I think was touched upon this morning, that only a vexatious litigant will, will know for certain that they are subject to a CPO, whereas a putative defendant court or tribunal may not. And, and in my submission, it's an important feature of the scheme in section 42 that Parliament has put the onus on the vexatious litigant to obtain permission first before instituting any proceedings um, or, or taking any other acts that are prohibited um, by the terms of Section 42. Now, if proceedings can be instituted first without prior permission, that, in my submission, fundamentally reverses the onus um, that Parliament has intended and expressly provided by the regime. And the putative defendant court or tribunal lose the protection from the time, resources and expense of having to deal with the proceedings until such time, whenever that is, that a CPO becomes apparent, and in the event that permission is later granted, uh, and in my respectful submission, that is a recipe for chaos when it comes to um, those who are intended to be uh, the subject of a CPO. Um, the second authority on purpose I wanted to take the court to was Attorney General and Jones, 
um, which is, uh, I'm afraid I don't have the tab numbers um, in my notes, but it's 228 of the authorities bundle, tab 17. This is an older um, Court of Appeal authority, um, and it was an appeal against um, the making of a CPO. And I want to um, take the court to uh, 865C of um, Lord Justice Staunton's judgment, AB 2234, uh, at C to D where he makes plain what the purpose of a CPO is. And two points um, to make on that. Firstly, the power is described as a power of restraint here. That restraint effect is lost if the um, subject of a CPO is free to institute proceedings first and get permission later. And again, the purpose is identified um, to include the provision of substantial protection to prospective defendants um, from um, the expense of vexatious litiga litigants and their litigation. And so we have um, two Court of Appeal uh, level authorities with the dicta that we respectfully submit supports our case as to the purpose behind the provisions. Um, and we've identified some other cases in the skeleton argument that are lower level, and I don't want to trouble the court with those in the interest of time. And we also identify another important um, purpose behind a CPO, which is the self-discipline deterrent effect. Um, and there are a couple of cases on that that I just flag up, um, uh, which are uh, identified, paragraph 21.3 of the skeleton argument, um, Senior Mill and Secretary of State for Justice and Chief Constable of Avon Somerset um, Constabulary and Benjamin Gray. But with those two Court of Appeal cases in mind as to um, the protection that's intended, I want to take the court now to seal, um, to um, tie that, that, those, that submission in to what Lord Bingham said about the issue uh, with this type of provision. Um, so was it, it just for you that what, was it necessary in this case for your clients to engage on the merits at the same time as they took the point that um, the proceedings were a nullity? Not strictly, no, because um, <laughs> if 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 we're right as to the nullity, there was nothing further to do. We take the point, um, and and um, and that's it. Um, but um, so, so you, in the circumstances of this case, you, you you weren't forced to be harassed in the sense of having to engage on the merits. That that that's correct. That was done um, out of an abundance of caution in case um, we were wrong about the effect. Um, um, but it wasn't necessary to do so in this case. Um, but it still required work to be done uh, and expense involved in taking the point because. Uh, the claimant hadn't um, brought that to the uh, tribunal's attention in his claim form. Um, and, the, and then the tribunal had to make um, arrangements to adjudicate that point. Um, right, you want to take us to seal now? Seal, um, which is um, Second bundle, isn't it? 440, tab 31. Seven, um, right at the very bottom of um, 443 is the beginning of um, the issue for this for this course in my submission um, and th there are two parts to this the first is that first sentence I do not think the answer to a question such as, th as this should ordinarily turn on a detailed consideration of the language used uh, by Parliament in one provision as compared with that used in another 
And pausing there, we say that that um, is precisely the, the trap that the appellant falls into in seeking to draw comparisons with the insolvency context or the charities context, because these are um, uh, requirements in different statutes with different purposes, regulating entirely different situations to um, an order made under Section 42. And, and we've um, identified um, the points of distinction in the skeleton argument. We don't want to um, use up the, the time by taking the, or taking the court to Park Cho, but it's, it's wrong in principle in my submission to um, on that first part of um, uh, Lord Bingham's statement of the issue to compare apples, apples with pears of, of requirements in different um, statutory provisions and contexts. We then get the um, important question, which is there articulated um, at 444 at B, and we say um, that's um, the, precisely the question here. And in, in my respectful submission, nullity is not a fiction because it may be a consequence of failing to comply with the requirements, as it was in seal. Whether it is so is derived from the process of statutory interpretation, which, as we've been through, isn't just about the words used, but the purpose behind the provision. Did Parliament intend orders made under Section 42.1, as defined by Section 42.1a, to have that consequence? And we submit it clearly did, and we pray in aid of, um, in particular, those um, statements from the Court of Appeal cases as to the purpose behind the CPO to provide um, substantial protection on substantive defendants' courts and tribunals. In addition, we also have, in my respectful submission, um, a considered opinion by Lord Brown on the point. Well, before you leave Lord Bingham, may I just ask what you say about the submission of there's a, uh, Mr Bingham, there's a third way that the, that the questions uh, identified by Lord Bingham are not are not uh, do not cover the, the, the third way that he identified, which he says this case falls into. Um, well, um, we we rely on um, we, we we submit that there isn't a third way in um, Lord Lord Bingham's um, articulation of the issue in which he is. No, but um, Mr. Wynne said there should have been. That's right. Sorry, my mistake. I was being emphasised. Mr. Wynne said there's a third way which Lord Bingham isn't covering here. He's only he said that the, the, the this case did not fall within the second uh, option identified by Lord Bingham because these weren't this wasn't a case of imposing a procedural requirement giving rights to the defendant if a claimant should fail to comply with the requirements, but not nullifying the proceedings. He said that it, that it fell into a different category. Because this wasn't a case uh, involving rights given to the defendant if the claimant failed to comply. Um, well, um, we I think the point to we um, submit that um, it is all a matter of um, statutory interpretation. This very issue, and what uh, the court has to do is consider whether Parliament intended to confer. A substantial protection and that's the, the fundamental issue um, for this court and for all the reasons we submit um, that is the um, self-evident uh, intention behind the draconian set of provisions that we have in section 42 well I'm just trying to, are you saying that the question are you are you saying that the question identified by Lord Bingham is the question that arises here? In other words, is it one of those two options? Well, are you uh, saying, are you agreeing with Mr. Wynne that this case falls outside that framework? No, um, we, we we think uh, we submit that um, Lord Bingham's um, uh, encapsulation of the issue, in which he's citing um, the previous case of Crown and Senegi, is is a proper encapsulation of the issue in the dividing line. Between being nullity as a consequence or mere strikeout or stay uh, 
as, uh, uh, as to which um, there may be rights um, given to the defendant, um, but the proceedings are not nullified. They can be resurrected. We, we, we submit that that um, correctly encapsulates the issue for this court. And that's irrespective of whether it's the defendant who, who raises the point or the tribunal or court itself. Precisely. Um, we, we then get um, uh, Lord Brown's um, considered opinion and uh, 460 uh, paragraph 74 um, where he um, opines that section 42 were, operates in the same way as section 139 of the uh, Mental Health Act is a clear and inflexible rule. And um, we see there the, the reference to those adjudged vexatious litigants. And so that feeds back to my earlier submission that Lord Brown must be taken to have been well aware that Section 42 empowers a High Court to make an order to adjudge um, uh, an individual a vexatious litigant, whereas Section 1392 of the Mental Health Act does not. Uh, and so we submit, and I, I don't want to repeat myself, but there, the distinction between the two, as argued by Mr. Wynne, is a distinction without difference when it comes to the consequence of such a clear and inflexible rule in my submission. Now, it's important, this wasn't a throwaway comment by a member of the House of Lords, um, but a considered opinion of an, an analogy with the provision that was before the court in that case. And moreover, that opinion received the support of the majority of the House, because we get Lord Bingham at paragraph 21 on page 448, um, stating um, that I wholly agree with the opinion of my noble and learned friend, Lord Brown. And we get Lord Carswell at paragraph 63 on page 458. Well, hold on. Lord, Lord um, Bingham, when he wholly agrees, doesn't talk about section 42 does he he talks about the mental health act no but but uh, we, i don't think he even referred to section 42 that, that's that my lady that is correct he doesn't but right. but his we, we um submit that where he says i wholly agree with the opinion of my noble and learned friend lord brown he must be taken to have read uh, the judgment of lord brown in which lord brown draws that analogy um, of the uh, between the clear and inflexible rules, and um, he uh, agrees um, wholly with, with that judgment. And so, although he doesn't refer to it himself in his judgment, he's taken in my submission to have agreed with that. And Lord Carswell, at paragraph sixty-three, <coughs> on page four five eight. Um, states um, that he's had the advantage of reading Lord Bingham's judgment and for the reasons which he has given, with which I agree. I would just quite, it is quite, you can see it's a bit tenuous. <laughs> <can't you? I laughs> mean, there's, a, there's an obiter comment. Okay, I accept what you say. It is a, it's, a, it's not a throwaway comment. It's an analogy, but it's still obiter, arguably. Well, I think it is obiter. <laughs> and then Lord Bingham agrees with him. And Lord Carswell agrees with Lord Bingham. So it is quite tenuous, isn't it? My lords, my ladies. It authority. becomes more and more remote with each speech that gets endorsed, but um, as a matter of construction of the judgment, the submission is sound that the majority um, agree with the opinion of Lord Brown. Um, well, what uh, is it you're I'm saying sure. that we should take from it? That they're analogous? Well, where does it get you? Well, we, we say um, that the, the specialist tribunals below were entitled to give weight to Lord Brown's considered opinion because he is a member of the But it wasn't binding. It was obiter, wasn't it? Of course. It? We accept it wasn't binding. Right. But um, there's dicta and there's dicta. There's a spectrum of judicial dicta. Yeah. And it's a question of weight and authority for the tribunals below as to what they consider... Lord um, Bingham had said, and you rely on it, that it's not much use comparing that the legislative provision that you're construing with legislative provisions that occur in completely different contexts 
and under different legislation. And you rely on that in relation to the insolvency and the charities provisions. So why are you now suddenly saying that you can rely on this comparable legislative provision? Um, well, I, th I, think, I think the point goes more to um, the treatment um, by um, the, the, the courts and tribunals below of that dicta and whether they were wrong to accord such weight to it that it was effectively binding on them. It, and because ground three, um, I think, argue, and ground two, both argue um, that there are errors of law in the, in the treatment. <coughs> Do you want to just show what um, uh, the EAT said about that? Yes. Um, so um, if you turn to um, um, core, if we go to the core bundle 36, page 36, and it's paragraph yeah. 67. Now, you, you what, read, what, um, what do we take from the fact that Lord Coswell carefully didn't say that he agreed with the <laughs> speech of Lord Brown? So Lord Coswell agreed with the speech of Lord Bingham, yes. um, and Lord uh, Bingham, by implication, agreed with the speech of Lord Brown. Is probably as far as we can go with that. The convention yeah. is usually, if you agree with two speeches, to say you, you agree with them, not to limit yourself to one of them. Um, well. Um, there it is. There it is. We, we, there it is. It's harder <laughs> when there are five as opposed to three. It's hard Indeed. not three sometimes. Um, but of course, all th what, what uh, Lord Carswell and Lord um, Brown both agree with Lord Bingham. Yes. Um, Who doesn't treat this as part of his reasoning? No. Who doesn't? But he, they do agree, as you agree, with what he said in paragraph seven. Yes. Um, but if I can just row this back to the point about the treatment of the tribunals below. Um, with this dicta, um, because um, my learned friend in his skeleton argument submits, um, I think this is in respect of ground three, that the tribunal and ET, EAT considered themselves bound by um, what Lord Brown had said in seal, and that is just a mischaracterisation of their treatment of that issue. They both not ET, bound. Not bound. Thought it was highly persuasive. They, they persuasive. not bound. They were cognizant that it was obita, but highly persuasive and. We submit there's no error of law in their treatment of it because it, it, it falls well within the spectrum of persuasiveness of judicial dicta. You're an ET or an EAT judge, and there's an opinion, a considered opinion by um, a member of the House of Lords, um, and you're uh, entitled to accord that um, significant weight in, in my submission. So there's no error of law in their treatment of it, is really how we. How we how we play that 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 point, um, but we accept it's not a complete answer to the point that this court has to grasp with, which it's is not an answer at all. Is it? Pa it's not an answer at all, really, is it? We've no. got to grapple with what it means. What the provision means and the purpose yeah. intended by Parliament is the question yeah. for this court, yeah. not what. But but um, obviously, this is a case where there's nothing that's binding on this court. But there, there, there is a selection of judicial dicta that one can see, yeah. and um, that is not to be discarded. But in my submission, you can inform the court's um, consideration of the purpose um, behind the provision. Your, your case, essentially, I know I keep on going back to Lord Bingham, but for my part, I find it helpful. Your case is for the because of the purpose, underlying purpose, coupled with the language. This provision falls within the type of provision identified in the first of his options, namely, Parliament intended to confer a substantial protection on the, such as to invalidate proceedings brought without meeting the condition. 
Precisely. as opposed to merely, my word, a procedural requirement, but not nullifying. My you're, saying, you're saying it's, and that's why you emphasise the, the purpose of underpinning the language. My Lord, that's precisely our case. That's your case. Um, I, I, I'm not going to sit down there, but rather um, <laughs> make some further submissions, if I may. Um, but that, that is precisely our, you have um, the point. Um, um, the deal with um, Edwards, um, uh, and I suppose I can short circuit Edwards because our point there really goes to the treatment of Mr. Justice Wilkie of that dicta in Lord. But he Brown. does seem to treat it as binding, doesn't he? And you accept he shouldn't have. We 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 take it. Uh, if I may, um, we we. Does it matter? Yes. Does it matter? Really? I mean, it we've, got to, we've, we've got, got to decide, to decide what it means. I, I think that's that's right. It doesn't really matter, but yeah. just um, so in case the <laughs> is there something in what he what the judge said in Edwards? Which he was think? also cognizant that what Lord Brown said was obiter. But yeah, again, yeah, so yeah, what? But, but um, is there any aperçu that he comes up with which adds to your? No. Look, well, there is. Um, he does <laughs> what? Um, again, this is a lower lower court decision, but his construction of. Um, the, the continuation of proceedings provision, section 42.1b and the leave provision it, it is a holding he makes that supports our, our submission of, on the construct, proper construction that you cannot continue proceedings unless um, uh, they, were, they were instituted before the CPO was made and um, I'll just flag that up um, I haven't understood that to be an issue as a matter of construction of section 24. It's. I, it, I, I'm, I'm, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I thought it was accepted that the continuation provision was intended to apply to proceedings that had been commenced prior to the CPO. Yeah. I think that's common ground. Yeah. But Mr. Wynne will stand up and say if I've got that wrong. Um, I don't quite understand the point. I'm sorry. This in relation what Mr. Kemp to is submitting, uh, which I had thought you accepted, is that section 24, sorry, 42, oh, yes. uh, I'm now 1A, B, in providing uh, for, for a reference to civil proceedings um, not being continued, was a reference to uh, civil proceedings um, which had been commenced prior to the CPO being made in the first place. So the, the prohibition, if you've got existing, at the time of the CPO, if you've got existing um, civil proceedings, he can't continue them except with the leave of the High Court. If you haven't yet got, that's B. If at the time of the CPO you haven't got any proceedings yet, then it's it's A that matters. You, 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 you've got to get leave to commence them. Uh, that, yes. That, we're, we're, that, that's not inconsistent with your Round you can do so retrospectively. Yes, I, I say that. But, but, but uh, that, that um, I don't think you were suggesting that it's it's one a b, which founds the jurisdiction to allow proceedings to be validated by leave, which is granted after they've been commenced. Uh, my lord, you're correct. I say the jurisdiction exists because because they're not a nullity. Yes, because absolutely, because this doesn't go so far as to cause them to be yeah. so I think I think I'm right in saying that the point you're on is not is not okay. very well. If I move right. on to my next um, topic, which was to deal with my lady's point about the ET's powers to stay and make on less orders, in so far as that may be of assistance. You're not pursuing any further points on Edwards. Um, I think. For my part, I think that's right. I've, I, I've, yes. I've just had a quick scan. Oh, I agree with the lady. There are no affairs <laughs> Um That he regarded himself as bound by. Well, I think with respect to the judge, uh, paragraph twenty-five is not right. So I don't think we need to spend any more time. Um, he wasn't bound by a seal, and his comments about what this court did in Johnson or Volks don't seem to me to well, be on the point either. But I don't. There it is. Um, there it is. What, you're, going, you're going on to the latest point now. We, we are. Um, we, well, we just want to. Uh, no, I'll, I'll move on. I did. I did think that what he meant was effectively bound, but um, it, it's not um, really what Edwards is. Not really what matters. Given the binding, given the binding authority, is his phrase. 
Okay. So Malay's point. The stay points. Um, so um, so 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 our primary position, as will be clear, is that the a court or the tribunal's jurisdiction in respect of those subject to CPOs is obtained from Section 42 of the SCA and not from the ET rules or the CPR. Yeah. And so, um, and you've, you've, you've heard my submission that Section 42 doesn't make any provision for stay or for continuation of proceedings other than those instituted before the CPO. So if proceedings are instituted without permission, our, our primary position is the proceedings are invalid and nullity, and there's nothing on which any stay or unless order can attach. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the rules is ultimately relevant. Indeed, so that's our primary that's your case. point. So all, any concerns about lacuna in the rules is on either hand or there. I, indeed, there is no lacuna because it's spoken for by Section Forty Two. We, we um, however, further and in any event, um, we submit that the ET rules um, do not further the object and the purpose of the CPO because um, and. I had hoped to avoid a trawl through each of the rules, but in essence, our point is that at every turn, be it the um, rejection of substantive defects, Rule 12, or at Rule 26, initial consideration, or Rule 27, dismissal, or strike out Rule 37, or even unless order, there is a right for the vexatious litigants to um, have an opportunity to make further submissions, including requesting hearing for that to be determined um, to revive um, the proceedings. And we submit that frustrates Parliament's purpose, clear purpose, behind making a CPO, which is that the ordinary rules of the tribunals and courts simply haven't worked. What is required now is the most draconian type of order that can be made. Uh, which is a debarring one, um, and so um, we, we th those are our submissions o on um, the ed the potential relevance of the ET rules. Um, my lord, um, <laughs> that's it. That, that's what all you're proposing to say on the rules, is it? It, it is. Um, that was I'd just be interested in your in your submission on on the point that which we, which we were canvassing, which is. On the assumption that it's not a nullity, would there, in any event, be jurisdiction to make an order of the kind that was being envisaged, or would that fall foul of not being a case management order empowered by Rule 29 because of the definitions in Section 1.3? Do, do you have a view on that? Well, so that's the case case management or judgment issue. They're mutually exclusive. You cannot have it. You cannot have both a case management order and a judgment. And it would appear that the type of order that's envisaged is 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 both. Why couldn't you have an order with two clauses? One of which came into the definition of a case management order, a stay, and one of which was uh, the unless order, which would be a judgment. That may definition. deal with that may deal with the point. I mean, the tribunals are designed to be more flexible in their approach um, than the, the civil courts, and that would make sense. Another option um, would be that you'd have to have two. Um, decisions one the stay to the unless order but we think in practice it's likely that tribunals would would do both they'd have to make it clear what they were doing at the same time to well, satisfy what rule would they make it under um <laughs> they would they would make it under um the the stay and, and disclosure request aspect would be um under um the general case management power so rule 29 Yes, but, but the. But then, does it not fall foul of three B, Little Roman two, because it is um, a decision that finally determines an issue which is capable of finally disposing of the claim? Um, not if it was. Um, well, it, it would have to. Um, so I, I think if it was simply a stay pending receipt of the of the. Um, application for permission and indeed the uh, permission um, it would it could fall within um, the, the general case management order power but if if um, what was being contemplated was a sanction at the end of which um, 
a dismissal maybe within contemplation it would have to be made on the under the unless order provision um, so it would have to be if it was done at the same time one part of it under under the case management order rule and the other one under um, rule is it rule um, 38 38 yeah. but but as I've previously submitted it's unattractive for rule 38 because um, it gives the vexatious litigant the opportunity to seek um, a review in the interests of justice, which is effectively an application for relief from sanctions. There's near, a case called Neary on that. And so it defeats the object and purpose of a CPO, which is to call halt um, to the um, proceedings where um, permission has not been obtained. Does that assist? Um, so, you, so, so it would be an order under rules 29 and 38 but it would require an avenue for the uh, affected applicant to come along and argue why the unless order should it, it, be it, it would, and, and we submit that's contrary to um, the, the, the purpose and object of the CPO. And it, it, could, it could be treated as two separate orders for the purposes of the definition in section one. Three, I think that which would be a, a flexible way of dealing with it. Are those, if I give my argument, are those, are those definitions there because there are different rights of appeal? In respect of case management orders and judgments, no, I don't think that I don't think there are any different rights of appeal. Um, but well, for the purpose of the distinction, then, <laughs> if I may, there's a right to reconsider a judgment, as I understand, but not a case management. But not a case management order. Oh, there we are. Oh, um, thank you. Um, but um, yes, um, whichever way you look at it, there is a further right um, to seek a hearing and make submissions and vex. The court tribunal and the um, putative the respondents to the claim. Um, and the, the, the other point um, to make um, is just a short um, CPR Rule 311 point that there was an amendment made. It may be convenient actually to bring that up, um, which is um, 111. The number is 111, I think. So um, it's one one one. So what we get at um, three point one one subsection one is an amendment that was introduced. I think I believe it's October of last year in the amendment rule number two rules twenty twenty two to incorporate um, the, um, the definitions of, or the, or the, 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 the statutory provenance of um, civil proceedings order, order in an all proceedings order. Um, and what's important is that um, the CPR itself doesn't, and this is common ground, doesn't specify any consequence, consequences of breach of the um, CPO. And we submit the reason why is that those consequences are self-evidently provided by the statute, and that is what um, the um, those um, who amended the rules would have had in mind by um, simply providing um, the statutory provenance for uh, or, or the jurisdiction for the order, rather than the consequence, which only applies to the lesser civil restraint order um, uh, beasts, if I call them that, um, for whom. Uh, there is a separate practice direction, practice direction 3C, that specifies the uh, consequences of breach of the order, automatic um, uh, uh, dismissal, um, sorry, automatic strikeout or dismissal without any further order, which in a sense mimics the, the grep and loan um, inherent jurisdiction articulation of the, of the, of the consequence. Um, and insofar as it's relevant um, whether we can draw anything from the cases in respect of CROs, and just pausing there, we do have in mind um, the paragraph 7 of Lord, uh, Lord Bingham's point about comparing different things, that I suppose it may be odd that these are um, to some degree regulating similar mischiefs. Um, but we have um, on the... Um, Mr Wynne takes as read that the, the sanction... Um, the consequence in, um, in respect of civil restraint orders can be subject to an application for relief from sanctions. Whereas you question whether Mr Justice Arnold was right. We, we do, and the reason for that is that Volupoli predates um, Cooper, 
and the nuclei, as far as we can see from the, um, the judgment in Cooper, um, wasn't um, uh, put before the courts to consider. Um, and so, um, Mr. Wynn, it cannot be taken as established, in my submission, um, authoritatively, that um, uh, a, a um, dismissal or automatic strikeout in respect of the CRO is intended to be subject to an application for relief from sanction. You're going to argue, going to argue that your argument is that the analysis of Mr. Justice Mostyn of Rupoli undermines what Mr. Justice Arnold said in Cooper. Yes, and Mr. Justice Arnold didn't have the benefit, as far as we can see from the um, judgment in Cooper, of seeing Mr. Justice Mostyn's consideration and reasoning of the issue in Rupoli. Which aspect of Mr. Justice Boston's reasoning so, <coughs> so it undermines we, Mr. Justice Arnold? So it's the. Um, we just. Uh, <coughs> 39. Yeah. <coughs> Paragraph 28 we were taken to. Indeed. Um, it's um, the penultimate sentence of. Um, paragraph 28, five th page author authorities bundle 535. Five. Um, so they are to be treated as nullities having been made in breach of the permission required. Now, in our respectful submission, that's clearly what Mr. Justice Mostyn meant as to what um, automatic dismissal meant um, within the terms of the practice direction. And then the next sentence, um, he said, where he says, however, I will go on to consider whether additionally can only mean a further and exactly what it says, a further and additional um, sanction um, that, that, that there should be a, a strike out as abusive. It's not. But how can you have that if it's a nullity? Well, um, what does it attach to? The proceedings are as if they've never been in existence. Well, well that we, we take that point, um, but we say that the true construction of the reasoning in paragraph twenty-eight is that um, uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn thought that the consequence was that um, they should be treated as nullities. And then he goes on to consider um, uh, the strikeout on a different, a different point. Which undermines abusive. his previous conclusion, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't substitute um, his, his previous conclusion. Um, but we take um, your ladyship's point that it may be seen that it's, um, there's some tension uh, between the two. I suggested this morning he may have meant alternatively <coughs> rather than additionally. But even then, I'm not sure it, it meets, meets the argument. But, 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 but what he doesn't say in terms, in my submission, is that, um, that the sanction should be strike out um, where um, there is. Um, uh, sorry, the, the, strike, the sanction should be strike out where uh, there is breach of the requirement in CRO. Um, uh, but, but there it is. We, we submit that Cooper um, didn't have, they didn't have the benefit. Well, um, nor, did, nor did Mr. Justice Mostyn have the advantage to see what Mr. Justice Arnold said in, in, um, in <coughs> Cooper, which was that, do you want to look at that? Yes, so this that's is the next, um, tab, that's the next tab of what he says. The, the, there are a couple of important 29. There are a couple of important points to make on. Cooper at 28 and 29 on 542. Um, the first is that um, uh, counsel for Mr. Cooper acknowledged that practice direction 3C contained no provision for permission to be sought and obtained retrospectively. So this case isn't an example of uh, retrospective permission. Retrospective permission um, has been acknowledged there as not being possible under practice direction 3C. But the second and more important point is that counsel for Lord Thomas didn't argue that the, um, the claim was a nullity. Um, so it's, again, based on an assumption rather than something that was argued before the court. And, and um, Mr Justice Arnold didn't have the benefit of, of, um, of the loop line. And so it perhaps uh, the, the whole the loop line Cooper uh, dichotomy um, can only really be taken so far. It's not an authoritative statement. Um, that um, the, the CRO, CROs are intended to be subject to 
the relief from sanction provisions. And in my <coughs> submission, that would be inconsistent with the terms used in the practice direction 3C, that it's a um, automatic strike out or dismissal without any further order. So the, 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 po the, the point is that's then the end of the road as the consequence. Well, as I understand it, what Mr. Chazard is saying is that a strike out is a strike out. And wherever you have a strike out, you have a, there is a power to reinstate to grant relief from sanction. Well, um, we, we he asserts that we, he asserts that yes, he doesn't, he doesn't see why the court shouldn't be empowered to grant relief. Well, the, the, the why do you say the court should not be empowered to grant relief? Um, because um, in our submission, it um, uh, a, a, um, it pursues a um, similar purpose and intention to the CPO regime. Um, re restraint means what it says that. Once the um, claim is um, automatically struck out or dismissed, that's the end of the matter. It can't then be revived through an application for relief, um, which may then vex the um, court um, and the opponent in the litigation, um, is, is our submission. I suppose you would say, if contrary to those submissions, Mr Justice Arnold is right, then it's significant that the rules apply that sanction in practice direction 3C to civil restraint orders, but they do not apply that sanction to uh, section 42 orders, of which the rule makers were well aware because they'd included it, uh, and that can only then sensibly have been on the basis that um, automatic strikeout wasn't necessary for those because they were already another two. That would fit in with my overall so hierarchy point. The hierarchy mm. point that mm. the CPO is the most yeah. draconian beast in mm. the armory and sits above the CRO. And just um, while we're on that 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 point, um, the commentary um, in the White Book um, to uh, Rule three eleven um, at three eleven one reinforces that submission because um, there is reference made. Um, to um, a case which I'm afraid isn't doesn't hasn't made its way into the authorities bundle, but Attorney General and Perotti. So this is page authorities bundle one one two, an order made under section forty two was made in circumstances where ECROs and GCROs had been ineffective, making it appropriate to impose a restraint. Sorry, um, I haven't caught up with you. Where, where are you reading Second from? Second bundle. Second, second hold, second hold punch from one one two. Yes, got it. Thanks. Um, that um, reinforces that that submission. Well, that looks as though it might provide material in support of your hierarchy argument. Yes, um, and 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 um, the hierarchy argument and the uh, separate and distinct statutory provenance of uh, the CPO and the, the the rules under which it's made. Um, um, Drawing these together, to get the scheme would be that a CRO does make express provision to be struck out automatically, which brings with it, if Mr. Justice Arnold is right, the power to, to grant relief from sanctions and have that reversed, whereas the CPO doesn't because it's higher up the hierarchy Indeed. to deal with cases where CROs have not proved effective. It's the last resort. And the most draconian power that the court has to deal with vexatious litigants. Um, that that would be our submission. So um, we um, I've I've already we've addressed comprehensively the statutory provisions in the different charities and insolvency contexts. I'm not going to go through those. It's in the skeleton argument. But I think now um, it may be convenient to give the court our summary submissions on the grounds of appeal um, briefly. Um, so core bundle uh, 13. Now, um, I think the first point to make is that Mr. Wynne is right but the issue for the court is, as both parties agree, um, and whichever way that 
the court decides that, that's really disposes of the entire appeal. Um, but um, so so we, we agree with that. Um, but um, one point um, to make is it, it did seem to be a um, thrust of Mr. Wynne's oral um, skeleton argument and to a greater extent his oral submissions that Article 6 uh, CPO was incompatible with right of access to court, Article 6. Uh, but there's no ground of appeal that the um, specialist tribunals below erred it, in their um, conclusion that the claim was a nullity because that was incompatible with the right of access to court in Article 6. And just for completeness, we have addressed that in the skeleton arguments, but that would be an impossible argument to sustain in any event because the courts have already held that a CPO is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim, both the domestic courts and the Strasbourg. Um, so, um, it, in my submission, it's a ground that's not open to uh, Mr. Wynne, and in any event, it's it's not um, a point that, that that can realistically be sustained. Um, just a couple of additional points. Uh, ground one, it, it, in my submission, falls down because it assumes that the tribunal rules are comprehensive as to the ET's jurisdiction, which clearly they are not. We there are many other examples where um, other statutory and indeed common law rules can take away um, jurisdiction that a tribunal would otherwise have. For example, state immunity cases or diplomatic um, immunity under the Vienna Convention for diplomats or judicial proceedings immunity at common law. And here the position is no different when it comes to an order made under section 421A SCA in our submission. Um, that, that is the um, where to look when it comes to whether or not the tribunals below were right to hold that it was a, um, the claim was a nullity because the um, uh, permission hadn't been obtained before the claim was instituted. Um, in any event, it cannot be right, and I've made this submission I think a couple of times, um, that CPOs are intended to operate differently in the employment tribunal to any other court or tribunal or criminal court and to that extent our interpretation of section 42 is much to be preferred because it's not um, in any way premised on expressly disavows of um, a tribunal specific approach um, and, and for the submissions I've made that that, that, that is consistent with the provision which as to which there's no warrant for any different approach made um, in any, any particular court or tribunal. Um, grounds two and three, um, I think we've, we've covered that ground. I don't intend to repeat those submissions. Um, ground four, we submit as academic, um, but in any event adds nothing to the appeal, my, my respectful submission. And that we then get the, to the Pitaway order point, and I think both parties agree it's academic, um, uh, and it follows the court's decision on the principal issue of the appeal of the submission. So I don't think I need to add anything further on that. Um, I just have one moment. I think um, that concludes um, the respondent's submissions. Unless I can assist any further with, with anything. No, thank you very much, Mr. Kent. Now, uh, Mr. Wynne. I have three brief points to make and reply, if I may. Of course. Do you want to say anything about the implication for the decision of this case on other rules in other courts? The point just made by Mr. Kemp, and we sort of touched on it this morning. We, we didn't. In, particularly in relation to CROs. CPOs. 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 So my understanding is that there are no specific rules addressing CPOs. The so section forty two stands by itself. Stands by itself. But for example, how would it work if you had criminal proceedings? So if you wanted to it's turning up section forty two. You wanted to um, lay an information before a justice of the peace, 
but mm. there was a criminal proceedings order that meant that you had to obtain leave first and you didn't so you lay your information before a justice of the peace what, what's the are you able to help us about what the position is for magistrates have they got powers to stay the information while you go off and get your leave are there other jurisdictions that you've explored where there are no express rules <coughs> dealing with stays in this situation? Um. Um, I've looked for authorities relating to CPOs and treating them as a nullity. And the authorities I've found are the ones which I refer to in my skeleton. I have no familiarity at all with the criminal side, so I'm afraid I can't assist on that. So there may be no jurisdiction in the magistrates to stay the information while you go off and get your leave from the High Court, which would tell against your argument, wouldn't it? Your focus on the employment tribunal rules is too, it may be too narrow, is really what we're putting to you. Because if it works for the tribunal, it's got to work everywhere, doesn't it? You can't have it meaning something in the tribunals and something different in criminal proceedings and something different in court martials or wherever. Um, I assume that there, there must be a provision to stay proceedings, for Why? example, to stay from one day the to the next for, something to, for some issue to be resolved. But my The, 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 the definition of court, wherever one takes it from, but if you take it from the Legal Services Act, something like that, is, is really very broad. Yes. Um, and it certainly covers all the other tribunals. Uh, it covers, I think, statutory inquiries, covers courts, courts court martial, um, you know, a really very wide range of civil proceedings. And uh, as my lady's just mentioned, um, if Mr. Kemp is right that it has to apply sensibly across the board, then a criminal proceedings order or not all proceedings order would have to take account of the position in criminal proceedings. So, so is the position that you're simply not able to identify for us what would be the procedural means in all those various other yes, that must uh, be. Uh, courts of preventing what might be regarded as unwelcome and vexatious consequences. Yes, I haven't, I've not considered that broader range of courts and their procedural rules as might apply in the future. Would you like the opportunity to do so? Yeah, I would take up the opportunity if it's offered. Thank you. Well, what I would propose would be that we would um, give you a very short period to do so in writing. You understand the question that's being put? Yes, it is. It is uh, essentially whether the procedural rules which I have argued could solve this problem in the employment tribunal could apply across the board. Yes, something like that could apply across the board. in all in all courts, all courts, all courts to whom uh, the provision the CPA yes. provisions apply. Yes. Could you give us that by by four p.m. Friday? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no right of response, obviously. Hmm? No right of response. My lords, my lady, would we have a right to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, well, I, Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. Very well. <laughs> well, we're anxious. There's only a small point, I think. 
um, although it may require <laughs> when family court to arrive. <laughs> well, uh, well, that's part of the that's part of the point. Part of the problem. Yeah. Not just I mean, um, I have yeah. one point in relation to the breadth of courts and the fact that there may be a difference in the procedural rules that some follow. What I say, the point the tribunal has, and some may tend to be less. Four p.m. Friday and then um, four p.m. Tuesday. Yes, but if I may, I'd make a further submission, which is that because of the importance of the PIX principle, because the, of the PIX principle. Oh yes, PIX principle. Yes. About clear words. Yes. You require. Um, if it is the case that in the employment tribunal it is possible to resolve this problem, but in some courts it's not, the proper interpretation of this would be different in those different court systems. It shouldn't be that How the... How can it be? Sorry. The same words must be interpreted differently depending upon which which jurisdiction you're in. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes, the effect should be different. If, if there is no way in which the words can be interpreted, let's say, in the criminal courts to enable a stay, then that is harsher. But that is the limit of what can be provided for in a criminal proceeding. It would be a, it would be a, nullity, a criminal proceeding started would be a nullity, whereas an employment tribunal proceeding would not be. If, if the point turns on the current procedural rule, yes, that is my position, because no interpretation of this should prevent somebody bringing their claim to court unless it's... Because of picks. Yeah, because of picks. Thank you. Right. Okay. Yes. So my three, uh, hopefully brief points in reply. So if I could take the court to section 42. One, yep. So... I wanted to make the point that, so we've looked at 1A and whether an order renders, whether an order under 1A renders proceedings a nullity if they're brought in breach. But there is, of course, the issue under subsection 3 of the means, the method by which leave is obtained. Now I say that uh, if it is the case that these sorts of proceedings are not a nullity, then 1A and 3 should be considered separately. 3, when prescribing some conditions, some restrictions on when permission can be granted, when it refers to institution or continuance of or making of any application, that should cover granting leave requisite. My point in essence is, if proceedings are not a nullity, subsection 3 should not be used to remove that benefit to the claimant. So subsection 3 should be interpreted to not restrict and to not restrain the attempt to obtain retrospective leave. All right. That's my first point. My second goes back to the procedural rules which we supplied this morning. Um, rules 1, 3, B, 29 and 38. So, Sorry, can you just go back to your previous point? The, the, in um, the situation you're envisaging, start proceedings and then go and get leave. I had thought you were suggesting the power to validate the proceedings by granting leave, albeit after they've been commenced, was found in 1A A. You just give leave to institute the proceedings, albeit that we're only doing so after they've been instituted. But are you saying no, that, that doesn't give you the power, it's 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 
one three, which gives you the power. The, it's the power to um, give leave to continue in one three that provides the power. Uh, word A A. If the claim is not a nullity, permits retrospective leave. Yeah. Um, Forty-two three should not in any way curtail that. A possible interpretation of subsection three is that the reference to institution or continuance of or making application is institution of after leave or yes one interpretation of institution leave for the institution of is that that is only institution after leave has been given and I say on the proper interpretation of 1AA leave is available retrospectively subsection 3 should not be read as to restrict that further, or restrict it in any way. Really? So, if you apply beforehand, you can only get leave uh, if you satisfy the High Court that the proceedings are not an abuse and there are reasonable grounds for, for the proceedings. But if you apply retrospectively, the matters at large, is that what you're submitting? Uh, if, in this situation, an individual has brought a claim, has instituted proceedings without leave. I say the proper interpretation is that they're, they're not a nullity. Yeah. And it is possible retrospectively to obtain leave. Yes, and that's and you say that's under uh, 1A, because that provides that you can have leave to institute the proceedings, uh, albeit that they've already been instituted, you can grant that leave yes. retrospectively, you say. Yes, but I, it's, it's what you're saying about subparagraph three that I was just finding difficult to follow. I would have thought that you are then seeking leave in a situation where um, proceedings have already been commenced. You're seeking leave for the institution of the proceedings. Yes, and that is subject to the conditions that you've got to satisfy the court that they're not an abuse and there are reasonable grounds for them. Yes, my point here is that the reference to leave for the institution is not a reference to leave for the institution in the future. It's a reference to leave for the institution earlier. There's nothing in three which uh, indicates that it has to be before. Yes. You say it's capable of being interpreted as including a retrospective application for leave. Yes. Right, thank you. Yes. As to the tribunal rules. Ten. Have ten. No, these are the... The supplemental rules. These are the later. Supplemental part will have two. So, so this is... Yeah. Yes. So, um, as I think we all understand, the order which I say can be made is one for a stay to order the provision of this uh, High Court leave order and an unless order. I wanted to be clear that my understanding is the unless order, the power for the unless order, does come from Rule 38. It doesn't... With what consequence for this case? With the consequence that if the individual has not provided a copy of the High Court order within the period yes. prescribed, uh, the matter will be automatically struck out. Is that a case management order or a judgment? So uh, I've got two responses to that. The first is I say that Rule 38 falls within, the dis within Rule 29. It's one of the examples of a case management order. But turning to Rule 13B, I say that an unless order starts off as a case management order. Because if we look at 
1, 3, B. It is a judgment, being a decision made at any stage of the proceedings, which finally determines. Now, at the point at which an unless order is made, it hasn't finally determined, because if the order is complied with, all of the issues remain to be resolved and the matter continues in a normal fashion. It says an issue which is capable of. See, for example, strike out. But, but at the stage the order is made, yes. that order does not finally determine the proceedings. It's capable of it. If, if there's non-compliance, it will lead to an automatic strike out. So at the point at which, so potentially at the point at which... Well, that's where it says capable of. But there is a... Those types of orders or decisions that fall within the context of judgment are narrower than what we find in subsection 2. They are narrower because of the, okay. the phrase which, fi which finally... It's only if such an order... Are you saying that an unless order is, does not fall within 2 because it, it doesn't finally determine the issue? It's only this actual strikeout which determines the issue, even though it doesn't necessarily determine it because it can be set aside. Is that what you're saying? The, un yes. the unless order is a, is, is, a, is a case management order. I say the order at the time it's made is certainly a case management order. And doesn't the actual strikeout is a judgment, even though it could be set aside. It, yes, it may be. But I do wonder whether, if we look at the provisions within Rule 38, whether these actually recognise that an unless order doesn't generate a judgment. Because the, 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 the reference to a, a judgment in the rules, as I understand it, or usefulness of it being a judgment, is that it can be reviewed under Rule 70, I think. It can be reconsidered yeah. under Rule 70. Rule 38 provides for an equivalent Thirty-eight two. A party whose claim response has been dismissed, etc., may apply to the tribunal to have the order set aside on the basis that it is in the interest of justice to do so. So there is a route within Rule Thirty-eight to challenge. Well, what's the position the if they don't do that? What's the order that disposes of the claim? Potentially it is the unless order, but it's only at that point of failure to comply that it's changed its character to one which has finally determined the proceedings. And it may be that the, the way in which those concepts don't naturally fit with 3b2, it may be because of that, that we have the provision in 38.2 to nevertheless reconsider. But in any event, Tribunals regularly apply unless orders under 38 to case management orders. I'm not aware of any challenge to that. It's the natural use of an unless order. So it ought to be valid here. It is, it is valid to require further information from a claimant and subject that order to an unless order in the ordinary course of events. That should be possible here, especially because all we are doing is asking for a copy of the High Court order. My, my third point, in relation to the argument that there's a hierarchy of comparable orders, CROs, CPOs, CPOs are the most draconian, and therefore it's natural to assume that they would involve proceedings brought in breach being a nullity. I say that assumption offends the PIX principle. It is a more draconian effect, removing the right to 
relief from sanction. Parliament should be taken to be aware of the, the ability to uh, specifically address that consequence. They have specifically addressed the consequences in relation to CRO. The, the proper appreciation of this hierarchy, I say, is that Parliament has decided not to state what the sanction is. They've decided not to say that relief from sanctions is not available. For the court to hold that those are the consequences would be inconsistent with Hicks' principles. It does, it does involve putting it lower down the hierarchy than a CRO, doesn't it? If, if the effect of a CRO is automatic strikeout but subject to relief from sanctions. I would say that it's in terms of the consequences, it's on the same level. Well, because there isn't, no, but there isn't even an automatic strikeout, if you're right on nullity. You've got to go through that step first. I say that it's in the interests of the court, of its own initiative, to strike out a claim which it sees as being in breach of a CPO. And that's through, that's the effect of these tribunal rules, or it's what, the, what could be done under the CPR. Um, but if there is a lacuna, if there's been a failure to deal with this issue, if in fact the court takes a view that the response should be firmer and more draconian, it is for Parliament to make that clear rather than for it to have failed to deal with this point. Um, my last comment in relation to that is there are two purposes to these orders. One, of course, is to prevent unmeritorious or vexatious or both applications, claims being brought before the court. But there is a a purpose alongside it, which is to not prevent meritorious claims from reaching the court. So bearing in mind those two purposes and the importance of furthering the purpose of enabling meritorious claims to be heard, in furtherance of that, I say, the Hicks principle applies, applies here. If Parliament intended this harsher effect, than it was on Parliament to have specified. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Wynne. So we'd be grateful if you would prepare written submissions by 4 p.m. on Friday with Mr. Kemp and your junior to reply by 4 p.m. on Tuesday. Yes, ma'am. We're very grateful to you both for your uh, written and oral submissions, and to those who sit behind you for their preparation of the case. We're going to reserve our judgments. In due course, uh, draft judgments will be sent out in the usual way for you to provide corrections of any typographical mistakes or minor errors of fact. It's obviously not an opportunity to re-argue any of the points. You understand that? <coughs> Furthermore, keep bear in mind and comply with the rubric at the top of the draft judgment, which provides strict rules about the uh, circulation or against the circulation of the draft judgment, and warns you that any uh, uh, failure to comply with those th that uh, direction will be a contempt of court. Yes, um, when we uh, send out our draft judgments, we'd be grateful if you would also agree the terms of an order um, that reflects what we've decided. Any disagreements about you or any issues about ancillary issues arising out of our judgment should be dealt with by short written submissions and will be resolved on paper. Thank you very much. All right.